Good morning, chemistry students. Here are your chapter eight, day four notes. We are gonna finish up our section about classifying chemical reactions. We're gonna be starting and picking up your outline at the double replacement reactions and going through and finishing predicting products of a chemical reaction. Again, by the time we're done today, you should be able to look at a chemical reaction and identify it as one of the five types of reactions you also should be able to write and balance a chemical equation for each type of reaction, whether you are given the products or not. So to kind of review what we have previously talked about, again, if we kind of even go back a little bit more than what I have written down here, and we go back to writing and balancing a chemical equation, typically you're going to be given that information in a sentence form. The first thing you're going to do is write a word equation. The only symbols in a word equation are plus signs and arrows. Everything else remains words. The purpose of the word equation is to help you focus on the parts that are important and get rid of extra information you don't really need. From your word equation, your next step is to write a skeleton equation. In a skeleton equation, everything will be symbols. Again, it's very important at that stage that you correctly write the chemical formulas for both ionic and molecular compounds. Once you have your skeleton equation, you will use coefficients out in front of your chemical formulas to balance your chemical equation according to the law of conservation of mass. Remember, you're going to observe that law by making sure that the atoms are equal on both sides of the equation or of the arrow. So you will be atom counters. We also talked then about the five types of chemical reactions, and we've talked about three of them so far. We have combination or synthesis reactions. In a combination or synthesis reaction, we have multiple reactants, so two or more reactants, and only one product. Typically, you will not be asked to predict the product of a synthesis reaction. Next type of reaction is a decomposition reaction. In a decomposition reaction, you have one reactant and two or more products. Again, typically you will not be asked to predict the product of a decomposition reaction. The third type of reaction you've already talked about is the single replacement reaction. You're going to know that a reaction is a single replacement reaction because you're going to see two reactants. The reactants are going to be an element and a compound. The products of a single replacement reaction are also, there are two of them, and it is an element and a compound. Single replacement reactions don't always take place. Sometimes for the products you'll have to write no reaction. To determine whether or not a single replacement reaction takes place, you're going to consult the activity series of metals or use your periodic table and the halogens in group 7A. In the activity series, as well as within the, on the periodic table, the strong elements are at the top, the weak elements are at the bottom. A weaker element cannot replace a stronger element in a compound. If that is trying to happen, you'll write no reaction. Today, then, we're going to continue to talk about our five types of chemical reactions by finishing up our discussion with double replacement reactions and combustion reactions. We're going to start by talking about double replacement reactions. The definition of a double replacement, sometimes called a double displacement reaction, is that these reactions involve an exchange of positive ions. Remember, our special name for positive ions is cations. Between reacting compounds. These reactions always take place because whichever element is stronger goes and pushes the weaker one out. And the weaker one just sort of takes whatever is left. 
So these reactions, the only reactions that you'll ever write no reaction for, might be a single replacement reaction. Again, we see an exchange of positive ions between reacting compounds. That means that in terms of our reactants, there are always two. And it's two compounds. So how will we tell a double replacement reaction from a single replacement? They both have two reactants. The difference is a single replacement reaction has an element and a compound. And these double replacement reactions that we're talking about right now, the reactants will be two compounds. In terms of the products, there's also always two. And it's also two compounds. It's different compounds. It's not the same because, again, the stronger um, metal positively charged ion has forced the one that's like it out of the other compound. Okay, so again, double replacement reactions, always two reactants, always two products, two compounds react, two compounds are produced. For these, you must be able to predict the product. You'll do lots of these with predicting the product. Again, if we think of our dating example and I think about superheroes, we're going to have Wonder Woman and Black Widow and Superman and Batman again. Okay? And it really doesn't matter how they're out on a date. Okay, it's sort of a double date this time. So let's say Superwoman, Superman and Wonder Woman are out on a date and Batman and Black Widow are out on a date. And as they're having dinner during their double date, um, we'll make kind of the girls the bad ones. Okay, um, Wonder Woman is really realizing she doesn't have that much in common with Superman. But she has a lot in common with Batman. And at the same time, Black Widow's kind of having the same experience. She's realizing she really doesn't have much in common with Batman, but Superman seems like the man of her dreams. So what they decide is they're going to let um, the other man drive them home from their date that evening. So although um, they came to the restaurant, it was Superman with Wonder Woman and Batman with Black Widow, when they're leaving, okay, Batman is going to drive Wonder Woman home and Superman is going to drive Black Widow home. So again, there's been an exchange of partners here. We still had two couples to start with. We still have two couples to end with. So we're always going to have two compounds in, the, in our reaction as reactants. And we're always going to have two compounds as products. But they're different couples, okay? They kind of, they swap partners. So that's our dating example. There's a couple other special things about double replacement reactions. First off, they usually take place between... Ionic compounds dissolved in water. That's called being in aqueous solution. So ionic compounds, again, we know in a, a substance is an ionic compound because it's made of a metal and a nonmetal, or it has a polyatomic ion in it. And most double replacement reactions, both of your reactants are ionic compounds. They're typically dissolved in water, so they're what's called as being in aqueous solution. Now, because they're dissolved in water, there has to be something that allows us to know that these reactions have taken place. So double replacement reactions usually form what's called a precipitate or a precipitate. And a precipitate or a precipitate 
is a solid that is not soluble in the solution. So again, what that means is the compound that is formed, our product, cannot be dissolved. Typically, our solution is going to be water. So typically, that means that the substance cannot be dissolved in water. Something, we have to have something happen so we know that single or double replacement reactions have taken place. So there must be a solid produced. which is called a precipitate. That solid is called a precipitate. A gas. And I want you to think back to when you were a little kid and you took baths and you thought it was funny because you produced gas. How did you know you had produced gas in the bathtub? There were bubbles. Okay. So same thing is here, right? We have these substances, these compounds dissolved in water. So we're going to know that a gas is produced because we're going to see some bubbles. Okay. Or we have a molecular compound produced. And a lot of times that molecular compound for us is going to be water. Remember that water is a molecular compound. So something has to change. Something has to happen for there to be a double replacement reaction. Remember, we have new substances produced. That's the characteristic of all chemical reactions. But for us to actually know that these double replacement reactions have taken place because they're taking place dissolved in water, we either have a solid produced, so we have a precipitate. So it's like we have a clear, if you kind of picture like, um, it's not the same example, but like this type of idea, right? If you have taken a sample of like muddy water, eventually that mud will settle down and you won't see it anymore. It'll be at the bottom, okay? But if you like shook it back up, you have that clear it's not clear anymore, right? So you have a solid produced. Your clear liquid that your reaction's taking place in, suddenly it's not clear anymore after the reaction takes place. There's some sort of solid in there. We have a gas produced, in which case we see bubbles being formed, or we have a molecular compound, which is water. That one's pretty hard to see happen. That you're going to see more when you write your balanced chemical equation. So we want to take a look at an example of a double replacement reaction. And the double replacement reaction we're going to take a look at is sodium sulfide um, reacts in aqueous solution with cadmium. to nitrate. Now again, you're going to notice that I didn't give you the products because again, for um, double replacement reactions, you're definitely pretty much always going to be predicting the products. So um, we're going to write our word equation. And so we know that sodium sulfide is one of our reactants. Now the aqueous solution is extra information we can ignore. So we know it reacts with, so that's a plus. Our other reactant is cadmium to nitrate. Here's our arrow for producing. Now again, we need to think a little bit about what takes place. And we said that our double replacement reaction, our exchange of positive ions. Our positive ions are going to be our metals. So sodiums are metal and cadmiums are metal. They're going to swap partners. So sodium's partner in our product isn't going to be sulfide anymore. It's going to be the nitrate. 
and cadmium two, because that won't change. Cadmium two's partner is now going to be sulfide. So they've just swapped partners. So that's my word equation. Now I'm ready to do my skeleton equation. So these are all ionic compounds because sodium and cadmium are both metals. So every time I'm going to write the symbols, I'm going to write the charges, I'm going to crisscross, and I'm going to make sure it's the lowest whole number ratio. Sodium is in group 1A. It has a charge of plus 1. Sulfide is sulfur as a single atom. It's in group 6A, so it has a charge of negative 2. So I'm going to write this as Na2S. Cadmium 2. Cadmium is CD. The plus 2 is telling us the charge on cadmium. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion you have memorized with a charge of negative 1. We crisscross down and we need to put nitrate in parentheses. Sodium is still Na with a charge of plus 1 because it's in group 1A. Nitrate is NO3 charge of negative 1 so nothing to do to that one. Cadmium is still CD with a plus 2 charge. Sulfide is still S with a charge of negative 2, so I could crisscross down the 2's, but I'd reduce them to 1 to 1. So, now I have my skeleton equation. Now I'm ready to go ahead and balance this. So, I have 2 sodiums. I have 1 sodium, so I need a coefficient of 2 in front of sodium nitrate. I have one sulfur, I have one sulfur. I have one cadmium, I have one cadmium. I have two nitrates, I have two nitrates. So this is now properly balanced. So again, I have a big long list of chemical reactions and I'm looking at just the reactants, there aren't any products written. How am I gonna know that a reaction is a double replacement reaction? I'm going to know because I'm going to look for two reactants, and both reactants are compounds. Our final type of chemical reaction is a combustion reaction. And the definition of a combustion reaction is that an element or a compound reacts with oxygen often producing energy as heat and light Now, the reacts with oxygen, that's important because remember one of the ways um, that hopefully at some point in the past you've learned about how to put out a fire is that you can smother a fire, you can deprive it of its oxygen. For something to burn, for something to be combusted, you have to have oxygen. And I'm going to warn you, your textbook as well as I am going to try to trick you by just giving you the reactant in a combustion reaction, one reactant and without the oxygen, and trying to see if you can remember that you have to add oxygen. So this is our definition of a combustion reaction. An element or a compound reacts with oxygen, often producing energy as heat and light. Again, when you burn a piece of wood in a fire, that's a combustion reaction, okay? So, in terms of our reactants, again, we're always going to have two. We have whatever we're burning and the oxygen. It's usually a hydrocarbon 
which is just a compound made of carbon and hydrogen. and oxygen gas, O2. Again, always O2 because oxygen is part of Mr. Brinklehoff. The products. For your purposes, your products are going to be usually carbon dioxide and water. And that's if it's complete combustion. And if your if it doesn't say specifically, then you can always assume it's complete combustion. If by chance your problem happens to say it's incomplete combustion, which is actually what happens in your car, then the products are carbon monoxide and water. But, for your purposes, you're going to always assume the products of a combustion reaction are carbon dioxide and water. The only time you wouldn't is if the sentence describing the reaction specifically said it was the incomplete combustion. You must be able to predict the products of these. Again, you're going to always predict the products as carbon dioxide and water unless it happens to say it's incomplete combustion. Now, combustion reactions tend to be some of the hardest to balance. So again, here are some tricks and suggestions I'm making from 20 plus years experience teaching chemistry plus more years than that as a chemistry student. So my trick is with combustion reactions is that you always do, or we'll say instead of using do, we'll say we're going to balance carbon first, then typically you're going to do hydrogen, then oxygen. And sometimes what's going to happen, because the oxygen on your reactant side is O2, sometimes you're going to need an odd number of oxygen. And you can't get an odd number when it's O2. So if you need an odd number, of oxygen, then the trick is you're going to take that number you need and put it over 2 as your coefficient on oxygen. Now you can't have a coefficient of a fraction, but to get rid of the 2, you're going to multiply everything through by 2. So then you're going to multiply every coefficient in your equation by 2. Okay. So we're going to look at two examples. Now these are ones where I probably will not give you a sentence, okay? I'm going to give you that hydrocarbon because realistically hydrocarbons aren't named with prefixes like other molecular compounds. So our first one is we're going to deal with C7H16 and we're going to burn it. So what's the other reactant we need even though I haven't given it to you? To burn something we have to have oxygen. O2, and it has to be O2 because oxygen is part of Mr. Brinklehoff. Haven't said anything, so it must be complete combustion, so we're going to assume our products are carbon dioxide and water. Now again, make sure you're leaving yourself room for your coefficients. So now I'm going to kind of start looking at balancing this. So I have seven carbons and I have one carbon, so I need a coefficient of seven. I have 16 hydrogens. I have two hydrogens, so I need a coefficient of eight. Now I've done my carbon and my hydrogen sum to my oxygen. So seven times two is 14 and eight. 
makes 22. To get 22 oxygens, I need a coefficient of 11. Again, if I check that, 7 carbon, 7 carbon, 16 hydrogen, 8 times 2 is 16 hydrogen, 11 times 2 is 22 oxygen, 7 and 2 is 14, and 8 is 22. This is properly balanced. All right, our second combustion reaction we're going to do, we're going to actually burn an alcohol this time. So C2H5OH, which I believe is ethanol. Again, to burn anything, I have to have oxygen. And again, we're going to assume it's complete combustion. So our products are carbon dioxide and water. So again, now we're ready to balance this. So we have two carbons, one carbon, so we need a coefficient of two in front of carbon dioxide. We have five and one here, which makes six hydrogens. And I have two here, so I need a coefficient of three to get six hydrogens. And I have two and one here, so I need, here's four oxygens and three, which is seven. I have one here, so 7 minus 1 leaves me 6, so to get 6 I need a coefficient of 3 on oxygen. To check this, 2 carbon, 2 carbon, 5, 6 hydrogen, 6 hydrogen, 6, 7 oxygen, 4 plus 3 makes 7 oxygen, this is correctly balanced. So now that you have learned the five types of chemical reactions, again we want to talk a little bit then about this idea that you are often going to be given just the reactants and no products and you have to be able to say what the products are. Again, the trick to doing that is that you must recognize the type of reaction. Just from seeing the reactants. So remember, on all of our notes so far, I've always written reactants and how many they are and what kind they are. That was why. Okay, so how am I going to know that a reaction is a combination or synthesis? Okay, I'm going to know something's a combination or synthesis because if I'm being asked to predict the products of it, I'm going to have two reactants and they're going to both be elements. How am I going to know that a reaction is a decomposition reaction? It has one reactant, and it's a compound. And the only way you can predict the products of these are if the compound decomposes into its elements. That would be the only way you'd be asked to predict the products. Okay. What about our single replacement reactions? To identify a single replacement reaction, again, there's going to be two reactants. One's an element, one's a compound. Remember, single replacement reactions don't always take place. Sometimes your products are going to be no reaction, you're going to write, because, again, you have to consult that activity series of metals. How will you know a reaction is a double replacement reaction? Again, you're going to have two reactants. The difference is a double replacement reaction, both reactants are compounds. Lastly, how am I going to know that I have a combustion reaction? Again, one of my reactants is going to be oxygen. Sometimes it's not written there. But I'll have a hydrocarbon. I'll have that carbon and hydrogen containing compound. So, if you are not given the products, before you try to write the products, 
you should write down which one of the five types of reaction the reaction is. Have a great day. I'll talk to you tomorrow.